No. Um, and I'll call this public meeting, the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment to order. My name is Ron Bonfruch, the MLA for the Debt Show and Deputy Chair of this committee. Today we'll be hearing from two presenters regarding committee's priority on Northern business engagement. Today's meeting is being live streamed on the assembly's social media channels. Due to the COVID-19 situation in NWT, we are respecting the chief public health officers gathering restrictions in Yon Life and the legislative assembly building is closed to the public. Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment will receive two presentations today. Each will be followed by a round of questions by, from committee members. As Standing Committee, it is our role to review any legislation introduced in the House. We also identify priorities related to economic development and environment in the NWT. These presentations are one segment of public engagement the committee is undertaking to explore ways the committee can support northern businesses in the Northwest Territories. The committee has identified a priority to seek ways to increase the responsiveness of GNWT policies and services to stimulate and diversify northern and in particular indigenous businesses. The committee will continue to engage the public on this matter and welcomes submissions and presentations. This can be arranged through the committee clerk. These presentations will contribute to committee work with the intention to make recommendations to the government. I would like to remind all members and presenters to direct all questions and comments to myself as the chair and to wait to be recognized before speaking to help us have a smooth meeting. I'll now ask members to introduce themselves for the record, starting with uh, Mr. Johnson. Good afternoon, everyone. Rylan Johnson, in the MLA for Yellowknife North. Ms. Knuckleby. Good afternoon, Katrina Knuckleby, MLA for Great Slave. Ms. Whale and Armstrong. Yes, hi. Um, Jane Whale and Armstrong, MLA for Moki. I'm not certain if there's anyone else uh, on with us, uh, but the other committee member that we typically have is uh, MLA O'Reilly. Uh, yeah, and I'm here, Mr. Chair. Thanks, oh. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. He's here with us. And I don't believe there's anyone else with us. Uh, Mr. Jacobson is uh, traveling, so he won't be joining us this afternoon. I will now invite Mr. Mark uh, Brazier, Chief Executive Officer of Ticho Investment Corporation and group of companies to, to introduce himself and any staff uh, that he may have with him and uh, to proceed with the, your presentation, Masi. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, it's, my name is Mark Breyer. I'm the uh, CEO of Clitro Investment Corporation. I don't have anyone, no staff with me. I'm lone wolf today, so uh, uh, I'll just be doing the presentation and then we can talk through any questions that you might have from that and uh, any other questions you might have. So. Um, background for me um, is I've been with uh, Cleetro Investment. I'm starting my fifth year uh, with Cleetro Investment. I've been CEO for the last two and a half years. Uh, so it's uh, it's been a while uh, and uh, covered a lot of ground in that time uh, as far as uh, my background. Um, just to give, um, before I get started with the presentation, um, I just want to kind of frame this. I, you know, this is my perspective on kind of the economic situation and some thoughts and recovery and, and, and that type of thing. Um, none of what you hear today is probably going to be that new. I've, I've probably for myself and, and with others, uh, probably put this perspective together a number of times uh, in different pockets uh, and, and sort of assembled it here. 
So uh, it may overlap with things you've heard before, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just uh, uh, just wanted to state that. And this is not, um, and I'll say, you know, as, par- as far as this goes, you know, economic recovery, procurement, the whole, this is not an easy topic. Um, and I think everyone needs to understand that, uh, it, you know, there's lots of perspective out there. Um, that it's it's an easy there's easy fixes there may be some um, but it's not just an easy you know there's no silver bullet uh, bullet there there's a lot of things that uh, can contribute to um, you know part of the um, uh, certainly economic recovery and and part of the how procurement works and how it can be improved um, and and changed so so that's uh, just sort of a frame frame uh, uh, framework as we sort of step into it. Um, so do you want, can you go to the next slide, please? So a few things that I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll give a little bit of background on TIC for those who may not know um, uh, a lot about it. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about some um, GNW, uh, GNWT economic, uh, you know, kind of urgent areas. This is based on the um, uh, information that I received or requested to, to talk to today. Uh, the NWT regional opportunities, uh, GNWT procurement, some challenges uh, and thoughts around improvements, um, RFPs, uh, the process experience, um, as well as some of the um, feedback on the emergency, emerging stronger plan. So um, it's uh, you, you'll kind of see it's all kind of tied together. So next slide, please. So as far as TIC's background, Clicho Investment Corporation and group of companies uh, is pretty widespread around the, obviously the Clicho region. And um, uh, we also do work in, you know, the Yellowknife area. Uh, so there's there's a lot that uh, occurs through, uh, uh, through the business. And, uh, you know, for us, um, the goal is not just to be um, uh, just a another um, indigenous company. We want to lead. We want to be, um, you know, basically at some point be like a global leader uh, and provide a legacy for the Clicho Nation um, as we roll forward through um, our environmental and social governance and uh, where we go. So, so we have a you know big job in front of us. Uh, lots have changed in the last few years, though. There's still lots to uh, to go uh, for us as a company. Uh, and what we do within the region and within the um, you know n- Northwest Territories and beyond. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So, just again, quick background: um, we have six business unit divisions. How we break up our uh, company: construction, utilities, uh, property, and real estate, site services, engineering, and environmental, and community operations. So just a, across the board, a number of companies within that. We've spent uh, the last couple of years in the background sort of amalgamating businesses. So we didn't have, uh, at one point, uh, I would say five years ago or so, there was over 50 businesses, a lot of overlap, community overlap. So uh, we spent a lot of time amalgamating those things together uh, so that we're in a better place uh, overall. This is just what we wholly own, 100% own. Uh, and within that, we have about 375 direct employees. Uh, and you can see by the stats there, we, we have about 61% of those employees are Clicho, uh, 78% Indigenous, and 92% Northern through that uh, process. Um, next slide, please. Along with that, we also have a number of joint ventures uh, and partnerships. Uh, some are, are well known, uh, like our Clicho QA partnership, which uh, you know obviously was part of the Clicho Highway construction. Uh, but uh, things like Clicho Air and Clicho Helicopter, and we have uh, varying you know varying types depending. Some are procurement uh, and supply companies. Some are um, uh, service companies. So there's uh, there's a lot of different things, construction um, and um, equipment companies. So a lot of different things that fall into play uh, with it. Uh, so it, it keeps us and especially me quite busy uh, from uh, year to year. So next slide, please. And I just want to you know kind of highlight a couple of things that, that we've been doing 
over the last little while. Um, things like the uh, North Arm Park expansion, uh, that's, uh, you know, the first part of it or the bigger part of it is, uh, has been completed. We're building a new cultural center in Bechico, uh, which is a big, big, big round building project. Uh, we do things in all the communities like the Gamity Motel construction we just built as well as um, obviously bigger projects like the Clicho Highway and our in conjunction with our uh, CUA partnership uh, and then we have you know obviously other uh, parts of our business like um, uh, like the Clicho Air um, and that is our actually our plane uh, that we lease to um, Air Tindy as part of the Clicho Air uh, business as well so okay next slide please So I'm going to get into uh, a couple of areas that, uh, well, uh, everything I kind of mentioned earlier. I'm going to start with the NWT economy and some of the urgent areas to address. So um, the, I, I have really five pieces on here, five areas that I sort of identified. Um, the first is obviously, and, and again, none of this is maybe may uh, news to anyone, but you know, I think it's just a it's a way from from my perspective on identifying what we have uh, in front of us. You know, the diamond mines are are all in their in their sunsets. Um, you know, obviously, there's some even with some of the extensions or some that maybe uh, you know more than ten years out. The, the change in their production, the change in the overall impact in, in what uh, in terms of employment is obviously uh, underway at this point in time. Um, that lost employment needs to be certainly replaced. Um, you know, ourselves, just not including other Clicho, just the ones who are actually our employees, we have over 100, um, 120 or so in mine um, positions today. So all of that, you know, we look for that in a primary thing for myself and, and TIG is to, you know, if, if those jobs don't exist anymore, what can we have people doing? Um, and how will some of that be replaced? But that, I mean, that's not just for us, but it, that's for, you know, obviously businesses across the region as well. Exploration growth, um, which is kind of the next level of, of mine. Um, there's a lot of critical minerals, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but um, you know, what, what do we, how do we fit in the global picture going forward uh, in terms of resource development and mining? Uh, very important piece as far as you know, you know, my, my perspective. Um, tourism. There's, uh, you know, everyone knows right now, and uh, you know, the last 24, 48 hours have uh, shown this again that uh, uh, tourism is a is certainly in in um, in need of um, some boosting, and then it's not just that. I'm also thinking about this from our perspective, from our businesses. How do we um, become part of that? We we're not really into any tourism today, not not in a in a big way. So I'm looking at that and saying, how do we do that? How do we compete with the Yukons, uh, for instance, because they're they seem to have. Uh, grabbed on to a bit more of that than than say the NWT has. Um, next slide, please. Uh, costs in the north, um, you know, obviously it's expensive. The cost of living is high. Utilities, uh, commodities, building materials, all very high uh, up in the in the in the stratosphere right now. In uh, a few areas, especially over the last year, year and a half. With supply chain challenges, the COVID challenges, um, and, and again, I'll talk a bit more detail on some of this in a, in a few minutes. Um, but competition from the south, all of that is, you know, obviously a, a major factor in how businesses run up in the Northwest Territories. And then the infrastructure pieces, uh, you know, major projects that um, can come forward that can replace some of that as we get into things like, you know, as the diamond mine shut down, uh, energy projects, construction, slave geological road, um, and then obviously more um, exploration that ties into some of that, that will allow uh, more, um, an expansion of some of the businesses that are out there, not even necessarily our business directly, but possibly indirectly, but I'll also talk about how it can directly affect not only the communities, but some of our businesses as well as we start uh, looking at some of these potential projects, you know, going forward. Um, 
and the idea to drive more improvement and expansion in the areas to really give us a chance to um, compete against southern companies. Uh, again, I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more in the future, uh, sort of more in the uh, in future slides. Um, due to you know local employment capacity building, again, more more to come on on some of that. So, to me, that's that's the the big five um, as far as the the big areas to to work on from from an economic point of view. Um, next slide, please. And then I, I got into uh, a little bit more, you know, opportunities, uh, some of the other opportunities that are that are right in front of us. I, I think, you know, there's obviously a reclamation and remediation economy that has started to get off the ground. Giant Mine, uh, Snap Lake, uh, Ray Rock, uh, those are all areas where um, some bigger projects that are, are in the process. Uh, obviously, these are critical for businesses like Tick um, and others who are, you know, trying to put employment into play, uh, labor, equipment, uh, you know, doing these projects. But, and I've said this many, many times, this is not a replacement of of the employment that occurs in the diamond mines. Uh, I always say, you know, the diamond mines are a thousand people for 20 years, uh, whereas, you know, reclamation might be 40 or 50 people for three years. Uh, it's not really a, and there is that, there is a perception out there from some that will just do a lot of reclamation and, and that'll replace some of that, uh, some of those diamond mine um, uh, um, jobs and, and uh, that economy, but it's not near the same scale. So, I, I mean, obviously that's uh, something that people can need to grasp a hold of. Um, in the critical minerals and resources, I kind of mentioned this as being something that's right, you know, potentially in front of us. But all of these, some of, or at least a lot of these fit together. When you start thinking about the growth potential or, you know, with smaller mining companies, maybe potentially getting into bigger mining companies that may shift focus or, or come into play here um, that may not be in, um, uh, in play today. Uh, th those are big uh, steps for us. Um, I, I kind of have a little um, phrase there, like going from lagging to leading. This is a, uh, for us, um, for the Northwest Territories, there's a lot of potential resources here. And, and you, you, you read about things occasionally, like what is the Russians and the Chinese and how are they doing things in the North? And, um, and it's, it's uh, an area where for us, uh, we aren't, um, you know, Canada, this is a Canada whole thing, uh, but even for the NWT specifically, uh, being a, behind a little bit on, on how we move forward with some of this, there's so much out there uh, for uh, car companies and um, and others that, that you know, want to go green and take a lot of the um, uh, fossil fuels off the, off the road, for instance, but they don't have the raw materials to make it happen. And and we, we know there is a um, there's um, uh, that potential in the Northwest Territories. It's how do we how do we push that forward? Not only from the NWT economy, but then you get into businesses like Ticks and others, where that becomes a um, certainly an engagement point, um, and how we have a conjunction with other with mines to supply labor and in, in the way we do today in some of those. Um, uh, things like Divex and De Beers um, and, and Acadi. Uh, but even going to that next level of maybe equity and, and getting further along, that does take time. Uh, and But now I think, you know, we're getting to that point of uh, we need to start taking those steps and how that engagement works in conjunction with the Indigenous businesses as we take steps forward. I talked about energy opportunities already a little bit. Um, you know, obviously, if you think of communities and, and the mines, you know, and how much diesel they burn and the carbon footprint and what, where, where do we go from, you know, being able to pull hydroelectric or alternate energies, other green sources that come into play, um, you know, reducing that cost associated with business because, you know, uh, there's obviously a, a major cost for for running diesel, you know, versus yes, there's a capital cost involved in, in the hydroelectric, but the longer term, it makes a lot more sense to 
uh, not only reduce the carbon footprint and greenhouse gases, but also get those costs reduced for businesses and communities. So this is sort of a win win uh, across the board that way. Um, with reduced costs and some of those utilities, there's more money that can be spent in other areas like labor, like exploration, like, like those areas um, that allow for uh, the businesses to potentially grow faster uh, or do more, bring more people on, be able to run more production if they're in the case of a mine or what have you. And obviously, you know, this is part of this is obviously it's not just the economic development piece it's what the environment looks like going forward and you know the the, the global crisis and again talk about a couple things in a few minutes um that we're under right now with uh, fires and flooding and and um the weather changes and you know uh, how how long are we going to be able to to continue to do um ice roads in their current format uh because of uh you know the the um challenges we have with weather those the seasons are very much fluctuating. Uh, we saw the warmth uh, in the fall this year, where ice was really not forming until almost December, when it really got rolling. So, so lots of things that can be in front of us, and and again, how does incentives come into play, and in some of that for uh, either communities or for uh, businesses or 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 others to work together to get some of these um, energy opportunities. Uh, in front of us. Um, next slide, please. And I kind of tied some of this into where the world is, is really going, um, especially from an investment point of view and other parts of, of the economy, which is, you know, ESG as a, as a whole. Um, a lot of companies are just realizing ESG, and I would I would say you know from a from an overall point of view, there's a lot of indigenous businesses that are already into into this, um, and just never called it this. Um, we've been with through the communities and through the you know uh, for for the cultural investment, for instance, through the TG and the elders and our board. There's been always a lot of you know environmental discussion and how does that fit into what we're doing and and some of our strategies going forward. Um, as well as the social portion of uh, dealing with our um, our communities and you know other indigenous and northern and northern spending and, and that type of thing and obviously the governance piece that goes with it and we and the reason I put this up here is northern companies can't fall behind some of what's happening in the south because the southern companies are really pushing towards this ESG is a big um, a big factor that companies who are investing in other companies or investment um, solutions are looking at ESG as a big uh, piece. And when I, we start talking about uh, greenhouse gases, for instance, or, or um, you know, reducing carbon footprint, those are big areas where there is, can be investment from other, uh, other businesses um, and even through the GNWT potentially. And I think rewarding those companies that get into this more and really show this is the reality um, is also a helpful piece to help them get um, further investment to help drive some other projects that may be very much associated with um, what regionally can happen in the in the GNWT. Um, as far as indigenous ownership and employment, um, you know, a company like ours is is uh, you know that's one of our two main uh, thrusts. One is obviously we want to um, make a profit for the Clicho people, but it's also as much as we can have uh, employment in, in the uh, in the grand scheme of things. And our ownership, we the reason we have, uh, you know, 12 companies is, is really our ownership is important to us. Um, and, you know, even some of those uh, partnerships, some of those partnerships are meant to get us to a wholly owned uh, scenario at some point. Uh, some of them are, are a little more difficult. Some are, you know, a little easier as we go down the go down the road. Um, but certainly, when we get into that, um, uh, it becomes that much better for us as a company. Um, and um, you know, and again, that, that pride of ownership for uh, Indigenous all over um, the NWT is an important piece. Um, and you know, we we look at this from an overall point of view, saying. 
how can we um, do do better? How can we have procurement programs that are, are improved? Um, how do we, you know, reward uh, the in- and incentivize not only hiring, but training programs and encouraging capacity building within some of those companies um, that I think we've taken a lot of steps over the last few years, certainly, but even more um, uh, can be coming. I think when we are doing things like bidding on items that are uh, for um, uh, for industry, there is more emphasis placed on the training and capacity building component than there is for some of the for example, government procurement uh, items, but but that's also part of how we you know we want to improve that as well going forward. So um, that in encouraging that capacity building, which again I'll talk about in a in a few minutes, is 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 great is is a great step if we can keep doing that. With all of this, um, we also have um, you know I, some of the frustration has been in the in the past is companies you know especially southern companies coming up and and doing and bidding and, and you know not necessarily and again i'll talk about size and and how that works in a, in a few minutes but um how how their scorecard how they're how they're audited through a process if a company says we're going to do x as part of a project or what have you how is that being audited? How is it being checked? Is there a penalty against that if it's not happening? Those are, are hugely important for uh, companies like ours. And, and um, you know, as we kind of look forward and say, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're competing against Southern companies who that have different intent than maybe we have. Uh, and um, that is a uh, uh, certainly a, a, a big portion of what we look at and say, how does... Uh, you know, a 51% ownership versus 100% ownership. How is that gauged, and how is that reviewed as part of the uh, part of the the process? Because you know, it's for us. I, it's never been. It, it does happen. I, I won't say it doesn't. It's not a part of anything. But there is a big difference between 51% in name and 51% in being able to manage and work with a much bigger company or or a much much more specialized company than we have the resources for that allow us to grow uh, and move forward. Um, and then, you know, indigenous equity um, in major projects, I think is another piece that has, we started, you, you know, you saw it with the, um, uh, with some of what the uh, NSI as part of the Clicho Highway and the Clicho government's portion of that. Um, so, you know, in infrastructure projects, but also, you know, mining um, and, uh, and and where other ownership models can be built and, and put in play. The challenge is for a lot of Indigenous, there's not, uh, there's, there's help. There's not necessarily a ton of money out there. It's very different than talking to companies who are in the South. Many, even our organization is, you know, just 15 years old. When you, when you look at it, it's, it's, it's not like uh, we have a, 60 or 70 or 100 years under our belt. So um, there's a lot of that that is, um, and, and we've had our challenges over the years. So it's not something that we can turn around and say, hey, we're ready to do this tomorrow. We have to build up to it again. So it is, um, there's there's challenges there for sure. Um, and some some smaller uh, indigenous um, uh, First Nations, or indigenous dev corps certainly need help if they're going to uh, uh, move forward with some uh, some of those areas. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one of the things we, you know, I just highlighted sort of one area when talking about GNWT programs. Um, I, I kind of based kind of this whole slide really around kind of education and where we're kind of in the north um i see since since i've been you know in the in the north working for the last uh four plus years it's really been um i've seen a lot of businesses people retire and the amount of uh, opportunities have shriveled up a little a little bit uh as well as the competition or, or the number of um, places to go for some services has 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 dropped off. Um, so I, I really and we're trying to do some things ourselves, uh, supporting some further training programs, uh, getting more opportunities out there 
for um, technical people, trade people. Um, it's and it's very tough. It's not an easy situation. I, again, if this was an easy one, we'd have more um, success or progress from what we're doing. But but a lot of the professional development, um, career development, um, you know, I, I I just threw a few things up here: engineering, medical, um, geological, project management. Um, and, you know, that's why I put the picture of the surveyor there because even that we you know, we've been trying to say to people. You, if you if you want to get into a job like this, we can help you, but it also sometimes we need help. But even working with one of our partners to get people interested and working into a role like this, they'll have a job for life and they don't have to go outside the territory if they don't want to. There's so many opportunities within it. Um, but getting that interest out to people is has been a challenge and, and I think um, you know, like for example, we've started a mentorship program uh, with TIC and the you know the education TCSA and and the Clicho government to try and draw some of those interests out so we can um, give kids students they know they have a chance to to talk to people who are in those careers because there there may be a big gap from. Uh, someone understanding what what does it really mean to be an engineer? What kind of engineers are there? Um, I know what it was like when I, you know, when I was going through high school and I said I wanted to be, you know, an engineer, and I really didn't even know what that really meant at the time. Um, and it was it was part of the process of learning. And I think you know that's why we, we're starting this mentorship program and building for that future and building you know a, not only a. a um, just an interest but once people get hooked on it they'll you know hopefully want to stay with that for a long time um but there's needs to be some in my mind some incentive programs to achieve some of this education like why do people have to travel for school i mean now it's becoming more obviously through covid one of the things that we've learned good or bad is you know not everybody has to leave to go to school although it's a it's a great um, growth opportunity for people to go off to school. If you're leaving a small community to go to even like in Edmonton, which is, you know, 1.2 million people, if you leave Wati to go to Edmonton, that's an overwhelming experience. And that's kind of why we're trying to do a mentorship program to help support uh, some some of these um, uh, students who are going that, that direction. But, but even if people do go and they do start that, I, I always have the, you know, I hear that people leave and then they don't come back. And, um, you know, what kind of incentive programs could there be to say to people, um, you know, uh, we'll help you with your education, but then you come back and work in the NWT for two, three, five years, whatever. Um, almost like the way the RCMP does some of what they do. And, and I don't really know that much about their program, but I know a lot of their, you know, their graduates end up working in the North for a few years before they go to a bigger city or, a, um, you know, further South in Canada. So, so I think, you know, we can maybe learn some of that. Uh, and then for companies, how is there, you know, tax incentives to help us, for example, do training or job shadowing? What else can we do? What, what else? And, uh, and uh, you know how else can we kind of put put some of this together, um, and and scholarship incentives. I would I would like to be able to sponsor someone and have them go through a scholarship to say become an engineer or an environmental specialist. And if they have that interest and do it, and how does you know we we're putting a commitment in for three or four years potentially to have that person come back. What do we, how do we get something that helps us do that? So again, just throwing that, that was kind of one of my, it's one of my things from, I've always been a person who believed in education being kind of the way to improving a lot of what's in front of us and improving people. And um, I think from, you know, especially it could be NWT wide, but especially um, how some of this ties into indigenous education as well. And um, so Again, this is um, just a perspective from from me. Um, and next slide, please. So, GNWT procurement. I, I think there's been some real positive strides um, as we've you know moved forward over the last uh, while. I still think there's challenges. Um, there's you know navigating the process for some companies is is difficult. Um, requirements uh, for uh, whether it's um, 
requirements for security or um, for other portions of uh, background, uh, number of hours worked on certain roles, those become a little bit more challenging uh, for companies and then it reduces the pool. Uh, and we wanna bring people in and the, the challenge is how do we build that capacity? How do we give people hours and how do they, you know, um, eliminate some of the, some of the uh, past issues that may cause some of the issues in the, that they're dealing with today. Um, even some of, and I would say, you know, around the, you know, the budgeting process uh, for bigger projects that has, and, and not even bigger projects, even smaller projects, the things that have happened in the last two years with the, the price of commodities and getting, moving items from one point to another and their supply Supply and demand has changed immensely over the last couple of years. So sometimes, you know, it's the, the budget side and how some of the costs are being put together um, certainly become difficult through the supply chain uh, for Northern companies. And, you know, and obviously the last couple of years, especially the number of fires, the, the what, it, what that has done to wood prices. And I think everyone knows it's not a, it's not a surprise to anyone to see here how much wood has gone up in the last couple of years. But, you know, the COVID scenario, what that's done, what that's done to the supply chain. And then other natural disasters like the rain in BC this year um, and the fires from last summer, uh, all of that has had an effect on the supply chain and costs that um, when you're looking at comparing a number to a year ago or two years ago, there, there almost is no comparison. And that has, you know, got to be part of the process of how, you know, we think through on, on projects. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, one of the things that I, I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier is Northern versus Southern companies. Um, there's everything from the cost of living to competition for talent. Um, you, you know, you can have a uh, hundred engineers working for a company uh, in in the south, uh, a bigger company. We don't have those big companies. They, they may have an office in, in the north, but really there's not that same level of competitive nature that way. So it's harder to get that talent um, around and, and, you know, striving to have people move up to the north to become part of that, um, part of a northern company is, is difficult. So, um, you know, when you're, when you're comparing a uh, for example, Tick versus, uh, you know, a company like a Parsons or a, um, you know, a, a Leadcor or a, or a Ellis Don. I mean, there's no comparison just based on the size, uh, the higher cost of living, bringing in, you know, less expensive talent from the South. Uh, even the, that movement of, of talent is sometimes a lot easier than trying to obtain local services. And that's getting even more difficult to we talking about with some things where, uh, you know, a, a, the owner of a business retires that business, you know, there may be one or two businesses of that type, especially trades businesses in Yellowknife and, and less so than as you get into community areas. So, um, and, and that recognizing that added cost of managing businesses and dealing with all those situations in the North is incredibly important when we're talking about you know bidding on procurement between uh, a southern company and a northern company for uh, for um, for especially major jobs uh, it's it's more difficult um, and I think there has to be some um, some um, and I don't want to say compensation in terms of money that's not what I mean it's more it's in terms of the thought process of how that works so that's um again some of the comparatives um uh, next slide please and uh last uh sorry a couple more things on the procurement piece um i, I kind of mentioned this uh, some of them already obviously smaller communities not as much technical capability just because of uh, the size uh, and the, the uh, amount of folks that are staying or coming back after they've been educated um and that help where we can get help and where we can do what we can to train and do capacity building while we're running projects because that's the not only the best way for people to learn it's really in some cases the only way for people to learn up in the in the north so for our company for other 
businesses. I think that's a huge part of the future is if we're going to keep moving forward with a lot of um, um, bigger projects that we can sink our teeth into, we have to get some of this, um, some of these resources together. Um, and, you know, building that capacity, the future, future of the economy, in my opinion, really is based on that. Not everything can come up from the South. It's really how does uh, how does that work uh, for uh, for you know we're building a, a young, um, vibrant um, uh, economy w- through that portion of building capacity, putting um, that training in place so that those people who want to stay in the north can stay for their careers. Um, and added into that is the indigenous procurement piece. Um, and, and you know, I've talked about this before. Partnerships need to be real. Partners, uh, it's a, it's not a matter of just putting a name out there. It's really trying to work together and how, um, how that will work. Um, obviously, we have a partnership with Qit as a perfect example. Those are, I mean, yeah, Qit's a big company, a huge company, but we're also learning a lot from them as a business, not only uh, uh, through capacity training. But, and, and employment. I mean, we, we, we trained over 112 people on the uh, Cleetro Highway construction. So there was, uh, and, and you know, people move on to other roles because it's you know, somewhat seasonal and you know, the number of people flex, but, but they learned and that's part of how we go forward. And it, it includes even things, safety and how we you know, manage our business. Those are all parts of the, the process that are incredibly important. And it's not just you know, hey, you do the work and just give us some money. That's not really the, not the intent, not from us, uh, for sure. Um, and that's why I talk about auditing from a, from a GNWT point of view, a project that comes out and saying, you know, if, if that is part of a bid where, uh, you know, there's a requirement is how is that being done? Because uh, so many people can check the boxes uh, and then maybe not follow along. And we've seen it. We've seen it from uh, some of the mines in the past who have a requirement and they don't meet it. And this, and, and I'm not picking on anybody in specifically. Um, and it they may come around. They may not. It may take years for them to come around. And that's a bit of a challenge. And, and without having some sort of um, uh, process in there where that's audited and, and, and there's either a penalty clauses or what have you against that, um, it certainly is a challenge for uh, companies that are like ours that is, you know, 100% um, owned and, and we're trying to push as many um, uh, Indigenous into roles as possible uh, as we go forward. So so the, it's a, it's it becomes a sort of a, an unfair, unfair uh, playing ground at some points. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and last, this is my last uh, overall slide. So uh, uh, we asked we asked about emergency, emerging stronger feedback. I think there was lots of great points uh, as I read through that. Um, there was, um, you, you know, a lot of things, some of the things I talked about here um, and some uh, obviously not, not in this uh, facet. The thing with any strategy is a strategy needs to be, it, it's a living document. Um, when we have our strategy, there is a review that happens fairly regularly because of that that point. It's not a, um, you know, you, you, again, coming back from industry over the years, 10, 12 years ago, big strategic plan meetings, week long, and then the binder goes on the shelf and everything just keeps going. That can't be what happens in, in the case of something like this. Um, and, uh, and that's really, um, really how the success will become part of that. But with it, you know, I always look at this as what are the action plans and the targets that come out of uh, come out of that. Um, I think there was, you know, again, I looked at some of the how dates were put in, and and it, it needs to be a little, in my opinion, more specific, more measurable, maybe broken down to a tactic level a little bit more. And then how is it defined? How do we defining is how successful it is, uh, because that's again part of uh, the challenge. Who's accountable for it? who's doing what and um, how is that at the end of the day, how do we say this plan is working, is not working. Um, and those are pieces that I think need to be uh, very much um, in front of 
uh, front of the public and then you know getting as much public input into that uh, as possible so I, I try to stay fairly high level with that because uh, it is such a it's a good document and there's a lot in there it's how does it all happen that's the that's where I come I come in with that so and I think that was uh, my last slide I think my next one is just asking questions about what I've talked about or if you have something else I must see uh, Mr. Breyer uh, for your presentation. I'll now ask members uh, if they have any questions and I'll start off with uh, Ms. Nalcombe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mark, for coming to present. It's always good to see you and, and everything that you were saying in your presentation. I know we've discussed before uh, in my private life as well as uh, when I was minister. Um, I agree with everything that you're saying. I, I think a key one is the capacity one uh, when you're talking about uh, um, attracting and uh, getting people to come up from the south. My sort of feeling to that then is, well, better than if we have people that are from the north uh, trained, but obviously that's going to be a few years out with our, our polytechnics. So um, I guess uh, where, and you, every time I had a question come up in my mind, you kind of answered it. So I just wanted to ask about the the partnership with uh, QIT and the Cleach OL Season Road. Uh, I thought it was very impressive. Uh, I was impressed when I got out there to see it. Um, I was aware of all the training that did get done. And I know that there are further opportunities for these types of partnerships uh, coming up. And I'm wondering, we talked a lot on our side with the GNWT as to their lessons learned, but with your lessons learned on the Indigenous side, do you, how are you capturing that? And then are you turning around and sharing that information with other Indigenous organizations and groups so that they can inform their uh, partnerships going forward? Thank you. Uh, so the first part, um, thanks for the question. The first part, um, there was a lot there, but the first part around the uh, the highway uh, construction piece, uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to take everything we, we so we, we learned as we went along with the, as that um, was a, you know, kind of a two and a half year plus the year through the bidding process and everything. We learned as we went along, especially on the um, capacity side and the training and, and that type of thing, um, where we... I found success um, was we trained a lot of people in in a lot of jobs that were were jobs that were um, kind of extensions of the current job. So, in other words, uh, all you say driving a rock truck in a mine is not like driving a rock truck on a construction project, but they're similar. Uh, there was a lot of you know crusher activity and and heavy equipment activity and that type of thing. What I was hoping for on that project, which we didn't get to, um, probably because we weren't ready for it, uh, was things like, um, I kind of mentioned the surveyors. I used that throughout that project as, if I could find one or two people who have an interest in doing surveying, um, I've got, we've got a partnership, we're working with a, a survey company, and you know, there's so much uh, opportunity there where we can you know, there's the resource around that, but that's the secondary part. The you know, figuring out how we pay for it is, we'll figure that out at some point. We've got to find that interest, and that's been the hardest piece. Um, and I think that's kind of partly why we're talking about a ment the mentorship program and trying to get that in play, and trying to get um, more jobs that are outside the norm, project managers. Um, there's been some great environmental training that uh, the Clicho government has done on a, what I would call it, on a base level. Now we want to get people into other roles. And we've got a few projects that uh, we've had going this year. And we do have a couple people who are have that interest. Um, so they will be, you know, be keeping moving forward with that. So that's a win, but there's more of that that we need. I really want to get, for example, a project manager who can they won't be coming in as a project manager because they don't know what that means. But if we can put somebody into a play where they become and they learn, it's, and, and not just from us, there's an internal learning, but I like to use outside companies because they do it differently than we would do, you know, and part of that is that's how that learning, you know, and grows. So, so I would say it was a mixed it was a bit of a mixed bag. Yes, we got a lot of training done. Um, what we didn't get was the diversification of the training that I would like to have seen. And as we go forward into other projects, I'm hoping that'll still happen. 
uh, drillers. And, and I'll give you an example of something we did over the last couple of years with our Cletro Orca blasting at uh, De Beers. When I came into uh, Tick, we had zero, and the crew, uh, that crew is 12 people. We had zero Cletro employment in that crew. Uh, we had an uh, we had a uh, um, you know an agreement with them, and I said this is we were just coming up for an agreement renewal, and I said we need to get training and capacity into there, so we did get as high as we had um, in 18 months. We went from zero to we had actually nine people who are Cleecho on the crew, um, and, and as you know, that does change. Mine life is not for everybody long term and all that kind of stuff, but we're we're at I think seven now. But seven out of 12, and we're still, and what we do is we bring two people in at a, what we call the green level, the ground floor, and then they learn other roles as they come up. It's like a pyramid to the 12. Um, and our goal is still to have a full Cleetro crew. Um, we're not there yet, obviously, but, you know, seven out of 12 isn't bad. But again, when I was, when I brought it up a few years ago, um, and we started on that, it took a while to get it off the ground, and then it has become... Um, you know, it's become somewhat successful. And hopefully, to me, it'll be successful when it's a full crew. And that's been female, male. Uh, you know, it's been a combination, uh, which is great. Uh, you know, again, part of the hardest part of uh, some mining pieces is the percentage differential. And even with us, we we run about 24% female. And that's another piece we're trying to um, uh, get more and more involvement in, in part of that building. So, so that's part one of the question. Part two being the, how much have we shared with others? Um, probably mostly. I've had lots of discussions with uh, Denton Cho uh, because we have been trying to work together on uh, – uh, items over the last say two years uh, specifically around uh, our bid with Snap Lake um, uh, that we put together and that was we talked about that a lot because we tried to share some of how we you know we, we got into certain places um, we with both of us uh, from from that company point of view um, we have different struggles uh, because we have different types of jobs uh, but we we were all in the we have the same mindset it's just a matter of how do we get there um, I'd like to do that I mean I've talked about it plenty uh, uh, at the you know at panels and and things like that at, at uh, uh, roundup and geoscience and, and that type of thing um, so that's the one-way sharing as I would call it I'd like to hear what other people are doing and uh, people like even um, like the um, and I've lost it out of my head uh, that uh, you know the, where, where they're much more they've been more successful um, and even out of uh, um, and it's they have the red dog mine in Alaska and again I've lost it out of my head they've you know the, we've been around 10 15 years they've been around for 30 years so they they should have learned a lot more and I know when I did have conversations with them they had a lot of failures along the way. And that's how you learn part of it too. And and for us, it's I'm trying to avoid some of the failures, but it, it does happen. And but it's also part of how do we get more people involved? And that for me is certainly a, a big portion of uh, of how we go forward. So I think that was a long answer for your question. But yeah, must see for that, Mr. Breyer. If, uh, perhaps we we have a. Well, three or four others uh, on queue for questions, and uh, usually we allow uh, two questions per member. Uh, we can try to keep our answers to the point and uh, short and brief as possible. Um, sure. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think Katrina had her two in there already, but uh, we'll let her have another one. Thank, thank you, Mr. It was kind of a two-parter of one same question, but um, I appreciate what Mark is saying. You're actually doing better in a female representation than Engineers Canada is, so uh, you can take some uh, some comfort in that. Uh, I just want to add that from my time of advocacy, advocating for women in STEM, uh, you have to get at the children, at the kids. So they say by 14, people, children have decided sort of which area they're going into. So just a tip, if you want to get more of those skilled labor people in, then to get them in to get at the young kids and go into the schools. Um, I guess my next question then is just, what if there was one thing that you could see the GNWT doing to make an immediate change right now that would improve uh, Indigenous businesses uh, operating, what would you have that be? Thank you. Um, I don't know if I, could, if I can limit it to one, but I, I think, um, I think, I guess it would two, kind of two parts to it, I guess. 
the first is, you know, from a long-term point of view, I kind of talked back to the education piece. That's a big component of the capacity building. It's, uh, and, you know, we, we know a lot of um, uh, Indigenous part of the challenges with getting like a red seal or a, um, uh, a journeyman ticket has been a lot of math and that type of thing. So um, that portion of the education, how do we, do we, how does that change? Because if we don't change something, it's the same thing. And then it becomes, oh, well, all I can do is drive a rock truck. And that's not what we want. We want people who can, who want to be able to do something else and we can help them. And that's not everyone, but it is, you know, it's a, it is obviously a, and that's sort of a longer term piece. Um, but I think I even, you know, kind of mentioned it and I've been kind of noodling this around myself is how do we like sponsor people? Um, I mean, I can't afford to give a lot of scholarships to people to to have them go off to become an engineer and then have them come back. But that's part of um, what I was sort of saying. And we need to kind of think outside the box a little bit. How do we get some of these people who have left or, you know, are off to school and so, you know, if you go to Calgary to go to become an engineer or you go to Edmonton or you go to Toronto and then, well, I don't want to go back to you. So how do we help that process? And that to me, some of that falls into if we're, uh, if we're helping that person um, through financially, for instance, and then have them come back even for, you know, and people say, well, two years or three years or four, but at least that four years, if you're getting overlap through that, you're getting more and then maybe you'll get X percentage that stay and stay long term. And I think that's a big, big component. Those two areas are one's a little bit longer term, but one is certainly things maybe we can do short term to help. All right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Miss Whale and Armstrong. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just have a question for Clitro Air. Um, I just want to know what Tech is doing um, to encourage or to promote um, young people to pursue career in aviation. Sure. Um, a couple times we've uh, we've put together with Air Tindy, and I've had this conversation again recently <coughs> with them. We we put together a a program um, and we, we actually had a plan about a year ago and obviously we waited for some of this COVID to settle down to go into the schools um, with a kind of overall career piece but uh, Tindy would come in with us as an example. Um, one of the challenges we have is you don't go from you know straight to becoming a pilot necessarily. Um, there's, a, there's some things along the way. Do you even want that? Do you even know what it really means to be a pilot in the north, for instance? Um, and then there's also, uh, you know, for every pilot opportunity, there's probably 10 other roles as part of Air Tindy, uh, whether it's, um, you know, maintenance roles or uh, planning or, you know, operational items. So so what we're, we have a plan. It's sort of been sitting on the... Uh, uh, sort of sitting on the sideline right now until we can get back into the schools on a little more regular basis. Um, and there have been some people who've come out of the communities who have started um, and they, you know, again, you have to come in and you have to, if you're, again, coming out of, some, say, a place like Wati or, or Gamity, where you come in and to train and to work at a place like Tindy, you have to be in Yellowknife for, say, for example, three or four months and we've done that and, and that hasn't always worked out um, because again, it's it's to some, you know, going into, it's a big community and they would rather be closer to their own community that way. So we're, we're gonna try and encourage it again. We have a plan sitting there um, and try and get some folks into uh, some kids and it's all goes back to, and, and uh, um, Ms. Knock will be uh, said it there. It goes back to the high school portion where we're going to, uh, certainly focus on that uh, that group and then say, you know, who has an interest and have people from Tindy talk through it's not just about being a pilot, there's a lot of other things that you may not want to fly, you may want to do something else in the process uh, so um, we're planning that it's just a matter of, it's sort of been on hold for a little while just based because of where we are with COVID but um, it's also something where you know, we have some 
thoughts to bring to the GNWT as far as uh, Clicho Air as well. So, so that's um, that's kind of where we are with it. Sway Alan, do you have a follow? Um, no, no, that's that's good. That's good. It's, as long as it's on their radar, because yeah. I know there are there are some young people that were talking about um, aviation. It's not yeah. just the plane, but there's also the he helicopter as well too. So good it's stuff. good. It's on their radar. Thank you. All righty. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you very much for the presentation, Mark. I, I, I guess I'm just going to get you to elaborate a bit on question Emily Knock will be asked a bit. I, I, I just like would to try and understand how far uh, TIC is and, and I guess other dev corps from being able to kind of build roads ourselves. And, and I know the, the partnerships have been great, but, you know, we, we've just come off completing the Wati Road, we've completed the Tuck Road, we just passed, you know, something like $500 million to be spent on the Mackenzie Valley Road. We're, we're probably going to set up a number, another P3 for the first slave, section of Slave Geological, and I know those conversations of how it's going to be structured are happening. I, I just don't have a sense of, is it possible, is there anyone in the North who could, for example, that, that first section of the Slave Geological do it with, without a cuit or without you know that that partner, a and if it is tech, you know what would you need to really get there? Thank you, Adam. Um, Mr. Breyer. I, I think, me, uh, Mr. Breyer, um, we're we're on a time constraint here too. So if we can try to shorten uh, some of the questions and some of the answers, that'd be very much appreciated. Must sure, you I'll, I'll do my best. So the answer is: Is it today? Uh, like, can we do it all today? No, we're not ready yet. Um, do we ha do we need, still need help with some of that? Yes. Uh, do we have the um, uh, so there's two parts to the like. Do we have a lot of the um, employment availability to do it? Yes. Uh, do we have like people trained? Yes. We don't have enough equipment to cover all that, but that's there's also a piece, and that's also a risky piece because it's very expensive. Um, what we don't um, have enough of is kind of what I talked about the project management. Uh, portion of it because it's very important. It's not just clearing trees and throwing down gravel. It's it's, it's a very complicated process. Um, however, we're getting there, and that's part of what we're you know been been working through. What we did with the Highway Three improvements last year, um, and what we're looking at what this year looks like going forward as well. So, um, is it going to be? Is it, are we taking steps? Yes. How far are we? Um, a little harder question to answer at this point in time because uh, we are you know kind of spread but um, will we get there yes so I see mr. Breyer um, mr. Johnson uh, thank you mr. chair and you know I was just recently in Petrico and I, I saw the amazing progress on the cultural center. I, I think that's, you know, one of those big success stories of the Clito government and the, the investment corp can celebrate, uh, you know, great getting the funding and, uh, and getting that construction experience. And, and I guess I just, I'd, I'd like to hear kind of a similar assessment of, you know, where Clito is at in regards to, we, we, you know, we have no shortage of buildings to be built in the, in the next five, 10 years by the GNWT and, and we're, and some will be P3s, you know, we're working towards uh, at least a $50 million fire center in Fort Smith and a lot of long-term care beds and a lot of housing, some in, in Clicho region. I, I, I'd like to just hear where the where Clicho Investment Corp at is on the construction side and ability to take on those contracts without partnerships or, or, or the gaps that need to be met in order to get that. Thank you. So well, yeah, when we do um, uh, the um, things like the cultural center, that is our 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 contract um, and uh, we still use subcontractors don't get me wrong I mean we do have some on specialty items especially um, and I would say things like HVAC uh, electrical um, you know it, like the the roofing piece we you were using a subcontractor could we have done more of the roofing ourselves yes there's a balance of time and number of people and 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 that type of thing who have that skill set because um, we do want to do it in a in a uh, time frame, yeah, so in some ways, 
Uh, we might even be closer on construction, depending on what it is. That's a very complicated building. If you, it's like there's not there's no square in that building at all. Everything's round, and um, so it's not only complicated to build; it's also complicated design. Which, again, when you look at, I even talk about I talk about engineering, but not like things like architecture and and that type of thing. And um, but um, uh, but so we, we will still need help for a while. Uh, it's not. It's going to be a long. It would be fairly long before we would say, hundred percent, everything's going to be done. Um, but having said that, I think we're we're quite a ways along on that that type of construction. So if we, you know, from a housing point of view, we do a lot of the work ourselves. Um, there is some sub trades in there, uh, and you know, again, it's getting that um, uh, that drive for for more capacity building for for people and learning those areas that we do have the gaps in. Um, and getting them trained in, in things like HVAC as a perfect example. So, uh, yeah, it's it's there's still some steps to go, but we're we do have. I mean, that's a well, that's the contract we took on, knowing full well we'd be doing subs. We manage that totally, um, and uh, but yeah, it's it's also uh, uh, also some gaps that we still have to fill. Let's see. Uh... Mr. Breyer, next we have uh, Mr. O'Reilly. So, Mr. Chairman, thanks for the presentation. Um, Mark, you talked a little bit about emerging wisely, and I guess I'd like to hear a little bit about what you thought of the COVID supports that uh, GNWT provided and how effective they were, how easy it was to access them, if there's still gaps, and uh, what role uh, GNWT might play. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, the more, I mean, from a from the business point of view, uh, we um, more relied on um, the CWS uh, ourselves because of uh, uh, the loss in revenue over the course of that uh, uh, year to year. Um, so we we didn't do a lot of um, other. We didn't pull a lot of other pieces ourselves in. Um, I mean, we had. Um, you know, we, we certainly were affected by uh, some, obviously what the what what happened with COVID. Um, but we tried for us, we were just trying to continue to push our way through. That was our biggest one ourselves. I know some of our employees. Um, uh, we we tried to keep everybody uh, employed at where we could. Uh, some of our employees through the mines and what have you uh, weren't able to you know keep in because of the tra travel and some of the mine. Um, uh, requirements and so because we do site service to the mines, uh, for example, we have about uh, over 80 employees at Divec who are our employees, um, and and that's that was always a, a bit of a challenge uh, that way. So um, I, I can't speak as much to what personally some how it worked for some folks um, within that, but um, we tried to uh, uh, like I said, we really only focused on one piece of that, and we tried to just keep our business rolling as much as possible. We didn't really shut things down and ask for for help in those areas. Um, that was the one area that we did uh, because we wanted to, um, you know, God, we had need a little bit of help to keep people, make sure we were keeping people uh, paid through that process as much as possible. So, um, yeah, so I, I can't speak too much towards any other part of what the GNWT did that way. Follow up, Mr. O'Reilly. Yep, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So, um, just want to talk a little bit about Colomac remediation. Um, I know a little bit about the process that, that was used where elders were brought in. They worked collaboratively with uh, the federal government to actually design the closure. And uh, they actually got a, a big fence built around the, the property as part of the their, their uh, measures to protect caribou. So, I think it was a great model in terms of community engagement and involvement. I, I just wondering a little bit more about at the business end, how that worked out for folks. And, uh, you know, I think that the experience from that project can probably adapt, be adapted and adopted on some others moving forward, like with uh, uh, some of the, uh, the stuff that might have to happen at Terra. Uh, silver mines up near Great Bear Lake and uh, some more work at Ray Rock and that kind of thing. But uh, happy to hear some more from Mark on that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, sure. Uh, the um, remediation portion at Colomac was 
actually, it was sort of just wrapped up um, right around the time I started. So I wasn't hugely uh, involved in that. Uh, but I know uh, what you're speaking of as far as uh, some of the um, elders being involved in, the, in that community engagement. Um, ironically, you know, I was just talking to uh, uh, one of the elders today, one of our board members who's an elder today, uh, about Ray Rock as an example. And some of the you know questions and that that are coming up because it's going through the process right now, uh, and there'll be there'll be more of that. And I think from a business point of view, it makes it a lot easier. There's there can be a lot of things that that fall into play that maybe we hadn't thought of, or we thought it was maybe this way, a specific um, uh, way of doing something. So for example, uh, uh, you know, winter road or a certain clearing area. That may not be the best for uh, the the, ter- the territorial area, the the, the community, uh, because of could be things could be caribou, could be a hunting, could be uh, more spiritual uh, based. Uh, so that's a hugely important piece. So we don't do things wrong uh, because the the last thing we want to do is do it do things twice, um, and or do something and do it wrong and then cause another issue. And I know, I mean historically there has been been areas where uh, uh, some of that has occurred um, and you know we, we are looking at projects going forward where we are we have community engagement kind of built in there um, I, I don't think and I, I'm, I'm, I don't think that the uh, Canadian government did as much with Ray Rock as they probably could have that's not to say that won't happen uh, because there is some things that will need to be done before before that would start into its next phase um, but I know when we went through and we've talked about other projects, the Cleacho Highways, it was a perfect example of that as well, where there was a lot of community engagement and a lot of work done by the government and um, as well as, uh, you know, our partnership and QIT and, and uh, the Cleacho government together. Uh, so all of those entities together to make sure everyone understood what was happening. And, uh, you know, as we as we put that project in play, it was... Um, much more it was much smoother than it it could have been a lot rougher um, and I think we we really need that as part of remediation especially w- with any of the you know the diamond mines that are coming Ray Rock um, uh, Terra you know we've got a lot of a lot of those areas um, that uh, yeah there's there's going to need to be some of that the more remote the, the more almost that engagement needs to be because there's things we don't know uh, where people live there all year round and or or in that area we don't know and and we're making assumptions sometimes so it is is an important piece absolutely is it important for the business anytime you have to do something twice costs us money and that's not a good thing for any business so let's see for that answer mr briar um okay just closing off the questions i've got a a question regarding your critical minerals and resources uh uh, presentation um, you got a desire to go from uh, lagging to leading I'm just wondering about you know what's the sense of the business community there in terms of uh, the Kincho spirituality and uh, and their ties to the land uh, absolutely and, and I know there this... was excuse me I know there was uh, some concerns about the the white the white beach or the white rock sands there uh, a while back that they wouldn't allow development in that area uh, i'm just wondering how how you balance that because of the when you talk about rare earth the minerals and mining and stuff like that we're using a lot of chemicals that are that are uh, that can harm the environment uh, you could speak to that Masi. um I, absolutely there's a, there's a couple things that uh, you mentioned there and uh, <coughs> excuse me um one is having the proper engagement from the uh, indigenous community who are whatever area it is you know speaking of the Clicho for the the white sands uh, or you know ray rock any of those uh, when we're talking about remediation or exploration um, you know fortune minerals is very close to wati um, so there's having that engagement and having ensuring that everyone understands what the process is because there tends to be a lot and this is not from any one group it, it kind of is the way it is when some of the um, uh, the, the um, communication may not be strong 
is people will make it up if they don't understand what's happening then they'll you know they'll say well this is happening and they don't necessarily know so the more people know and the more people understand uh the better that is and i think you know your your point is very valid in saying whatever the process is if that process means um uh, uh for example something can't be done on site and has to be moved and be done to at a different site uh for processing uh absolutely that has to be part of taking into account of whether or not a particular uh mine is uh or mineral is worth it or and or what it does um as far as um, the area um spiritually or culturally around that so all of that has to be taken into account it's not just a matter of here's your permit and 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 go um those are all pieces i mean obviously we there's a big lesson to be learned out of where giant ended up um with the um uh with its uh challenges with um um you know environmentally uh we don't want to get into that with other areas um i guess that was my point was um never to kind of gloss over that just more for for the fact that you know but companies not just like ours but even even companies that are you know that are out there that are looking at exploration from a GNWT help point of view um you know Canada is is far behind not just NWT far behind on that that type of exploration because there's so much happening in in places like China and and all of that uh and where we're going um into the future of what's needed that's going to be you know critical for 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 us and for the globe i guess as part of that but never um it really needs to be done properly um and that goes that's part of the ESG component that's why i kept you know kind of focusing on ESG because it's that it's socially um and and from a governance point of view and from an environmental point of view all together those are all important pieces um and i don't i mean i will never profess to know all the pieces in any area that's why if something comes into a certain area like again they'll use fortune minerals next to wati um and what's important to the klecho community uh, especially wati or the completely klecho region needs to be taken into account whether it's where we put a road um you know how an ice road is put in or what is the actual process for uh doing that uh, and you brought up a good point with white sands uh i believe it was uh, initially the entire area and i think that's changed over time to be a, a smaller portion and another area, and part of it can be can be mined or can be harvested um but that hasn't happened yet either so but that, that still doesn't mean go it means making sure everyone every shun is aware of what needs to be done so um so it's a very good very good point it's it it all has to be covered All right, thank you very much for that. Uh committee uh and Mr. Breyer uh we're in of our session here with uh yourself but uh we really thank you for joining us and and presenting to our committee today. It was very informative as uh we look forward forth to uh you know business engagement sessions and uh and hopefully to formulate uh, an opinion present to the government of the northwest territories so we thank you again and uh, masicho committee will stay on uh, will stay online for our next presenter uh, hey thank you very much for the invite and um it was it was nice talking to all of you and uh yeah look forward to how we go forward thank you
the executive director of the Yellowknife Chamber of Commerce. Um, if she could, uh, I'm not sure if you know all the members on the committee, but I think we'll do a committee introductions uh, for your sake. And I'll start with uh, who's on my screen here. Uh, right, Mr. Johnson. Good afternoon, Melissa and Rob. I'm Rylan Johnson, MLA, Yellow Knife. Um, uh, Ms. Knockleby. Good afternoon, Katrina Knockleby, MLA for Great Slave. Mr. O'Reilly. Governor O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Ms. Weyel and Armstrong. Jane Weyel and Armstrong, Armstrong, <laughs> MLA for Mopi. Thank you. I see Cho and uh, myself, uh, my name is Ron Bonnertruch, uh, MLA for the Dead Cho Writing and uh, currently chairing uh, this meeting for this portion anyways. Um, if we can get uh, yourself uh, to introduce yourself and anyone else with you and uh, proceed with your presentation, Masi. Perfect, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So my name is Melissa Sire and I'm the executive director uh, for the Yellowknife Chamber of Commerce. And I just wanna say upfront how um, thankful we are for the opportunity to speak um, to everyone today. And I'll be turning it over to uh, the president of the Chamber of Commerce, Rob Warburton, who will be leading you through that presentation this afternoon. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak to the uh, committee here. Um, pleased to speak on behalf of 351 members of the Chamber um, and give our insight onto different ways that we can um, improve the Northern economy. Can I have the next slide, please. Um, so areas of the online economy that are most urgent for the GMT to address. Uh, oh, wrong one, overview of the slide, what's wrong? Um, we received a request from the committee to speak uh, on the responsiveness of GMT policies and services to stimulate and diversify the Northern economy. Three main areas the Yellowknife Chamber like to talk about are uh, areas of Yellowknife economy that are most urgent for GMT to address, uh, GMWT procurement for NWT and Indigenous businesses, and then some feedback on Emergent Stronger. Next slide, please. Uh, this is gonna be the, the chunk of the presentation here is uh, areas that, uh, of the life economy that are most urgent uh, to the chamber uh, for the GMT to address. Uh, first off, we need to be open for business. Leisure and business travel have been decimated through a prolonged closure of our borders to tourism. The loss of skilled labor, products, services, and facilities will take a large and concerted effort over many years to rebuild. Before our closure in the spring of 2020, NMT attracted over $200 million in tourism revenue. Uh, in particular, in Yellowknife, these are very sticky dollars because they permeate uh, layers of businesses that you might not associate with tourism. So restaurants, cleaning companies, um, even the real estate uh, world has been affected by this. Uh, while I fully appreciate this is due to public health measures, uh, is incumbent on the GNWT to be prepared to significantly fund and support tourism operators and associated businesses once the border reopens to leisure travel. Uh, transform Aurora College. The transformative plan that was initially proposed to change Aurora College into a modern polytechnic university was bold, ambitious, and forward-looking in, in a way that was very achievable. It would not only drive long-term, sustainable, and significant economic growth in the territory, but it would also increase the educational opportunities for all Northerners. Unfortunately, what has happened instead is when the government was faced with making some very hard and uncomfortable political decisions, uh, it folded and defaulted to what appears to be Aurora College 2.0, with a focus on skills that frankly do not match the modern economy or what modern businesses need. Um, it appears that the GNBT has decided to do what the initial report said exactly not to do and simply repackage the existing structure into a polytechnic. While this project now progresses largely without any meaningful input or direction from anyone except bureaucrats, the Chamber of Commerce is still very much interested in participating and seeing the polytechnic happen including a new campus and student housing in Yellowknife, where it is currently and obviously needed. What is urgently needed as well is for the GMT to make some assertive and tough decisions based on what is best for the whole territory and not based on what is politically expedient. This will allow us to maximize the benefit of a truly transformative opportunity for our economy by focusing on providing programs and degrees for the 21st century from a truly arm's length organization. Uh, support Yellowknife fiber redundancy projects. 
with the recent announcement of a partnership between Dayton Show Corporation and Northwest Tell, all the components are in place to make this project a reality. To make it happen, the support and participation of the GMBT is required as a partner, customer, and advocate. Uh, for reference, during previous internet outages in Yellowknife, we estimate that a one-day disruption uh, in the city results in a GDP loss of $4.75 million in Yellowknife alone. On top of that, you have the inability of most government offices and services to continue to function while you're still paying for them. It is obvious that preventing even a short outage makes this project an excellent investment for GMBT. This is preventative maintenance. Um, attract talent to address labor shortages. We're, we are entering a prolonged period of labor shortages throughout the country, not only in, in the NWT. With our comparatively high cost of living and high cost of operating a business in the North, the NWT must show creativity and leadership by having policies and, and processes that make us the most desirable place for both the public and private sectors to attract and retain talent and labor. Adjusting our policies and processes so the NWT has the most modern and efficient immigration process in the country is one way the GMT can assist in addressing labor shortages in the near term. Office of the Fire Marshal. This is where hopes and dreams and large amounts of money uh, from the building community and, and from the business community uh, go to die. The current structure, policies, and legislation, and frankly, unchecked power of this office means many building and investment projects um, that managed to get started, they must face an arbitrary Okay, or we lost uh, uh, some. Uh, Mr. Easter Herring, Mr. Bonnerich? Just speaking. Okay, great. Um, I'll leave my video off. I think the internet's unstable here, so. Um, or back up there. Uh, yeah, so many building and investment projects that the business community would like to make just never get off the ground. If they do manage to get started, then they must face an arbitrary, unaccountable, and unknown cost structure by submitting to the whims of the fire marshal's office. Even the GMT isn't immune. Uh, the Department of Infrastructure and Housing Corporation have both faced major delays on projects, even going to court essentially against themselves uh, to get projects moving. What is definitely needed in, is a meaningful, accessible, and robust appeal process, as well as, a clear, as, well as, well as clear policies, legislation, costs, and timelines for turning around an application in this office. We have heard that MAC is responsible for bringing forth a, build, a Building Standards Act that may address some of these concerns. However, the current timelines we have heard are up to six years to make, just like, make these legislative changes, which is frankly unacceptable and inconsistent with the economic goals of this assembly. If the department is not capable of producing legislative changes in a timely manner, the private sector is more than capable of providing those for them. For reference, the Lottery Fund Act and corresponding taxation changes were done in about six months by using an outside contractor. For some policy and legislative changes, we are not unique or special and can just utilize the policies of other jurisdictions and modify them to our situation. Uh, speed here is of the essence. GMT leasing policies. The current GMT approach to leasing all forms of property is siloed and disconnected from the operational, creative, and financial realities of Northern business community. It does not provide an opportunity for many Northern and indigenous businesses to provide the space the government needs to operate. In Yellowknife alone, GMT spends approximately 18 million bucks on office leasing and rents well over 100 residential units. The economic impact of these funds, uh, largely not going to northern owned businesses, is substantial throughout the North. COVID also has drastically accelerated the changes that were already happening in how the private sector uh, and public sector builds, procures, and uses spaces. For example, the federal government had a goal pre-COVID in 10 years of decreasing their office space by 30% by using kind of new and innovative models of uh, optimization. Um, the GMT appears to have not adjusted their approach accordingly to match the realities of the market changes. Uh, what is needed is a whole government approach designed so a Northern business can bid to provide the space or provide the operational efficiencies to use the space better.
most recent example of this, which is quite front of mind for most people, uh, is the day shelter here in Yellowknife, which quite the chamber is quite happy to see was successful. Um, it is not lost on us that when when a when a business was given the latitude to creatively and realistically solve the problem, uh, that young life business solved that problem in a matter of weeks instead of a matter of months or years, actually. Um, the young life business community is really innovative and has the ability to fix these problems, uh, if not painted into a corner or not given the opportunity to do so. Uh, pursue all federal funding opportunities to support critical infrastructure projects, Tolson hydroelectricity expansion projects, Slave Geological Province, Grays Bay Road and Port projects. These are all well, well-worn well uh, advocacy things that the territorial government's doing. Uh, we'd like to also add that um, some of the recent I infrastructure investments, uh, took in Inuvik, have been through D&D, &D, uh, and we'd like to see um, some effort by GMT to kind of add Department of National Defense to their lobbying efforts. Um, they will deploy funds in a way that is different from most other government departments, so I think there's some opportunity there to add them to the, uh, the list. And then one point I didn't have on this slide, but I did add in, um, was there's currently a process where GMT lands are being transferred to the city of Yellowknife. This is an incredibly important process to maintain momentum on. Access to land and, and space to grow businesses is one of the main issues faced by Yellowknife businesses. By allowing the city to control all land within its boundary, it can provide the dynamic and responsive supply of land needed for our economy to grow. In combination with the proposed zoning bylaw changes, which the city of Yellowknife is just bringing through, business and residents will be able to confidently invest in our community, not be held up by highly regulated, burdensome, and inefficient bureaucratic processes. Next slide, please. So Virginia WT procurement for end of and indigenous businesses. Uh, we are very supportive of an indigenous procurement process. Um, what, what the chamber would like to see is a, a modern, progressive, and meaningful indigenous indigenous procurement policy that would create equitable opportunities for these businesses to succeed. Um, I, I think this will drive a lot of economic activity uh, in Yellowknife. Uh, alignment of procurement policies to the structural and fiscal realities of um, northern businesses. Example of this are smaller tendering opportunities, longer lead times on contracts, and matching the tender structure to the financing realities of small business. An example of one of these things uh, not going correct is Health recently had a tender for warehouse space, 10,000 square feet of warehouse space in Yellowknife. They spent a year putting the tender together. That space does not physically exist in our city, never mind for lease. So a little more uh, lead time would have saved a lot of time and effort there on the government's part. Um, provide more notice on upcoming construction projects and publish a list of these upcoming projects on a regular basis. Um, Lead times are long here, so having a uh, best notice would be helpful. And standardize the procurement process and ensure all the GMT agencies bidding opportunities are available in one location, um, particularly the ones that maybe don't fall under BIP or don't have to be contracted. Um, those kind of uh, short-term or smaller contracts would be very helpful. Next slide, please. Uh, prompt payment. GNT should set timelines for payments to be processed and published and publish actual performance measurements against these timelines. Uh, to be fair, we saw this during COVID. This was a concerted effort by the GNT to support business by paying by paying their invoices fast. Uh, what we'd like to see is just formalized, if it's not already done so, um, to make sure that this is now the standard going forward. Um, we've seen that the government can pay quickly, so let's make that uh, um, a policy that we follow. Creating more opportunities for small businesses to participate in GMT procurement. GMT should explore cost-effective resource opportunities to divide large projects into smaller projects, increase participation in smaller companies. Um, the vast majority of businesses in Yellowknife anyway um, are actually home-based businesses, sole proprietors. Um, and I would think that would be true among many businesses in the North. Uh, it's a capacity issue. So um, putting out large tenders that then get subbed out south um, is not helpful. So it would mean more tendering, but the smaller those can be broken down uh, in a reasonable cost-effective way um, would allow more businesses to bid on those things. And this one in particular is avoid narrowly, overly narrow content language that requires bidders to use specific models, approaches, or brand. Um, allow businesses to propose a viable solution. So uh, I work in, in, um, in real estate and I see this when I see like housing core tenders for procurement or um, you pull the documents and it's like 
instead of describing the problem they want to solve, like a three bedroom house with feet, it's like, here's the roof pitch, here's the foundation, here's the material list. Um, it, does, it doesn't give, well, two things. It doesn't give the flexibility for a business to actually solve your problem. Um, and what you're doing is you're just driving up your costs because now you're, you're forcing a square peg into a round hole. So um, we're incredibly flexible and good as a business community of solving a problem like we solved the day shelter. Um, so changing how we approach tendering to be more descriptive and like describe the problem versus uh, the current approach, which is very, it, it presumes that the government already knows all the solutions to the problem, which to be fair is not possible. So um, broaden out those descriptions and kind of allow, allow yourself to be pitched the best idea. Next slide, please. Emergency strategy document needs actual items with budgets and timelines rather than the vague language it currently contains. Um, we're excited to see that it's front of mind uh, for the assembly. However, that document was essentially fully nothingness. There was no budgets, there was no timelines, there was no commitments of any kind. Um, the government has an obligation to do more than seek support for critical industries like tourism, hospitality, and I think you have a responsibility. Uh, again, we appreciate public health measures in place that restricted a lot of the movement on the border, it's still a government order, right? So it's still an arm of government doing that. So I feel you have a responsibility to, to mitigate those impacts. So language like seek is not, is not encouraging. Um, and the COVID economic responses have shown the business community that GMT, you can be decisive, you can move quickly when you're motivated. Um, this approach to getting things done is extremely important going forward. Uh, I would argue this should be the way you operate uh, all the time. I understand you can't throw everybody at a problem um, full court press all the time, but uh, if nothing else, this showed us that the barrier to getting things done is not a lack of ability, it's a lack of will. So how do we line up um, and incentivize uh, the government to operate more in that way? Because uh, we can do great things. We have amazing talent in the public service. Um, I just feel like it shouldn't take a, a, you know, a pandemic to unleash uh, all that hard work. Uh, in closing, I'd like to summarize that most of the previous points uh, by saying uh, it is time for the GMT to realize that they need to take some risks. The GMT's current approach to economic growth and diversification, especially with items they mostly control, like Aurora College, is to mitigate their own risk to zero as much as possible and, and put all that risk as much as possible on somebody else. By doing this, the cost is that there is little to no economic reward for those efforts. This is Economics 101, no risk, no reward. Taking calculated risks is how businesses learn and grow every day. The GMT is not similarly willing to take a larger or even some risk. They should not expect to achieve the quick, dynamic, and responsive changes that are actually required for the economy to grow uh, in an increasingly competitive economy. Um, to grow, you as elected representatives need to provide the leadership, support, and most importantly, I think, the permission and incentives for the government to really take those risks uh, to start moving this needle forward. Thank you for the time. and I'm. Looking forward to questions and hopefully my video working. Try it again. Uh, I must see Joe, Mr. Uh, Warburton, um, for your presentation. Um, I just need to clarify uh, clarify that uh, we're a committee, the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment. Uh, we're, we're something like uh, the opposition party, if you want to use Good. that. <laughs> Uh, we're not exactly the GNWT. What we're doing as a committee is soliciting uh, um, comments and observations and uh, uh, recommendations. And uh, we will be putting that those recommendations once we uh, gather all the information and be recommending to the GNWT on behalf of uh, the business community and our committee. Uh, to, on moving forward on all the different subject item, uh, matters. Um, I will now invite the committee for question period and we'll start with Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I wanna thank the, the Chamber for the presentation. Yeah, the uh, last slide on uh, emerging stronger sounds a lot like some of the criticisms uh, I've leveled in the House about the uh, lack of uh, details, timelines, uh, specifics, measurables, and so on. But uh, appreciate the, the, the comments from the Chamber. But 
Um, I guess uh, maybe I could get some comments on what you think are some of the main lessons that we learned as a result of the uh, um, pandemic and, and how the business community in general um, has adapted and uh, will continue to adapt uh, coming out of the pandemic and what role uh, GNWT can play in uh, as uh, our uh, economy starts to emerge from the pandemic. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Walburton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lai, for the question. Um, I think, um, just kind of going back to the presentation a bit, the lessons learned was that um, you know, the territorial government can be very dynamic, can be quick, um, in a good way. So um, we saw things happen very quickly, you know, IGI redeploying funds, um, different parts of the government moving very fast. Like I said, I appreciate that was like a full court press working weekends, so not really a real realistic expectation all the time. But what it did show is, is, is the barrier is will, not ability, right? We have an amazing public service that is very skilled. And when you just get out of their way and let them solve a problem, it's amazing what they can do. So, um, so but I feel like there's there's often, you know, you, you hear it all the time from various levels of, of government, they're, they don't they don't get the permission or the support or the ability to, to drive the thing. Um, so I think COVID has shown us that that can happen. We can move very fast. And also on the business community side. So again, using the day shelter uh, analogy, right? Like um, Pete Howling did that on vacation on his phone in a weekend, right? Like uh, when given the latitude to just solve a problem, we did, right? Um, and there was a lot of Young Life businesses, even a, a year before, myself included in 2020, trying to help solve that problem. But the box was painted very narrow. You know, it was very prescriptive. Um, that solution was known to the business community for over a year and a half. Um, that recommendation was done forever ago. So um, we can also help by being dynamic, but we need to be given the, the kind of the leash to do that. So, um, and going forward, I think the expectation of businesses is gonna be um, that we're continue to be flexible and, and dynamic. I know like um, this is also shown as we can run kind of lead and mean too. So um, I, I think the outcome here is you're gonna have stronger, more resilient businesses uh, to work with, uh, but they're also gonna expect a stronger and more dynamic government to work with. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, follow up, Mr. Riley. Oops. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I think about some of the gains that we did actually make during the pandemic, you know, we, we basically had a, or we had the, the semblance of a basic income program. Uh, some of it from the feds, obviously a uh, managed alcohol program. We managed to house most of our homeless people in Yellowknife. Uh, and we did set up shelters in a number of the regional centers as well. So we, we want to make sure that I don't think we lose some of those good things. But um, I want to ask a little bit about, um, you know, you talked about fiber redundancy and uh, um, what other things though, uh, sorry, this committee just finished a report on uh, trying to make internet uh, more affordable and accessible for people across the NWT. So we've kind of been starting to turn our mind to that. But um, Yellowknife, we, we actually have reasonable uh, internet access. It's still very expensive, but uh, any views from the chamber on, on how we uh, might uh, better ad address you know, the digital divide beyond fiber redundancy? Thanks. And Mr. Walburton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, so 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 currently the um, you know there's there's a lot of other technologies coming online. You got satellite technology and all kinds of different ways of providing internet. But um, by far and away the best the best most reliable internet that we know of right now is hardline, right? So um, I think that's going to be our our in Yellowknife anyway. That's going to be our main source. Our fiber line is going to be our main source of internet. Um, there's not going to be a lot of you know satellite that's going to work in great communities. I think that would be hard pressed to get a hard infrastructure, but, um, and also it's like a, a bit of a mental shift. Like the internet is not a nice to have anymore. This is like a road, sewer, you know, the economy literally just stops working, right? Like um, the grocery stores, their ordering system to order trucks of food, there's no internet they can't order. There's no ability for them to call it into the phone, right? So like 
this is a critical piece of infrastructure that going down for a day is, like I said, is very expensive. If we had a, say a forest fire and the line's down for a week, like it's, it is, um, it, it's emergency level stuff. So it's critical infrastructure and I think it needs to be treated like such. So, um, and especially when you got a private sector stepping up, essentially, you got Northwest Tell willing to run it, you got Dayton Show willing to fund it. Um, what it needs is the biggest consumer, GNBT, um, to both, you know, commit to consuming, which I don't think should be a problem because that's never going away, um, and advocating for at the federal level to help get that funded better. So um, the map doesn't work as a private sector, complete private sector project. Uh, so it needs government support. Um, this kind of leads into the leasing side of things too. Like I, I know the government, you know, it's, it's causing some of a debt ceiling. It doesn't want to sign long-term contracts because that will affect your debt ceiling. Um, but it's not like you're going to stop renting offices and consuming internet. These things are going to go on forever. So it's matching kind of the reality of financing and doing some of this stuff. The private sector does require long-term contracts and commitments um, and not shying away from those just because of a debt ceiling and trying to figure out how to do that. Because there's, there's good debt and bad debt. And I think good debt is, is stuff like the internet. So. Next, we have uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Rob, for your presentation. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, congratulations on your new role as president. I look forward to working with you. I, I, I guess I'd like to, you know, I, I appreciate your comments on both the, the Northview ownership and the Office of the Fire Marshal. To me, this is a, you know, Yellowknife is a town with full of vacant buildings, and, and those two factors are the biggest causes. As one, many of the buildings aren't up to code, so they will probably remain vacant absent any policy changes. And then some of the vac buildings are vacant because they are owned by a company who doesn't care to fill a 10 story tower anytime soon. I, I, I guess I think <laughs> we both agree on the problem, but I'm still slightly confused about how we actually get there. And I, I'd welcome any input on how, you know, we solve that problem so that we are not a town of, of, of vacant buildings and, you know, a town with, with some sort of local ownership and, and you know, can, who can actually refurbish existing structures in our community. Thank you. Ms. Warburton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Rand. Um Yeah, so I guess I guess there's, we're very uh, unique in young life, especially when it comes to both commercial and residential real estate. Um, you got two different planets operating here. So you got large corporate, um, REITs that trade on the public stock market. And then you got local owners who are dealing with, you know, traditional banking and funding. So these, the current approach that government for, for leasing currently is they approach it all the same way. So it's, it's, they talk to me or they talk to a large corporate REIT, they treat it the same way when it's an apple to an orange when it comes to the, the financial background. This is why, you know, in the presentation where I said matching the financial reality, the way that if the GMT wants to incentivize local ownership is that development corporations, indigenous governments, um, they don't have access to capital like a large corporate entity does. Um, so structuring your leases and your procurement in a way that allows them to buy or, or, um, or get, you know, to get loans and debt to buy these things. Um, like all these assets could be owned locally uh, if the leases were, if, if, uh, when I said whole government, right? Um, the whole way that leasing is done is currently very ad hoc. You know, as lease comes up, they do their lease. And what they do is they just retender exactly the same space for exactly the same building. They don't think about how could we incentivize kind of local locals to build this or own this. Um, it's all designed in a way to just keep the same system going because it's easy, right? You just call one person and do the same thing. So um, whereas the needs of a local owner let's say like a local development corporation is very, very different. Um, they need to lease structure in a very different way. So it's kind of weedy here, but this is a significant amount of money that the GMP deploys every year in the city. Um, and right now, most of it leaves the city, whereas if there was more local ownership, it would stick here, right? That, that, that profit or income would stay in Yellowknife and the territory. Um, and this to me is an easy win because this is a policy and process change. We're not asking for more money, not asking for more it, you just change how you do a thing and you redirect tens of millions of dollars back into the territory. 
Uh, the impact is great, I think. It's just incredibly nuanced and boring. So, um, so does that answer your question? I think so. There's a second part there, but I missed, I missed the second part. Mr. Johnson? Yeah, no, that, that, that's great. We appreciate it, Rob. And, and I guess I would like to hear, you know, I, I, <laughs> I have expressed my frustrations through the Office of the Fire Marshal, largely brought to me by constituents or contractors or architects or engineers who, and the GNWT departments themselves who have found themselves in conflict. I, I guess I would just welcome any experience either you have had through your businesses or through chamber members have had uh, to kind of color some of the issues we are having. Thank you. Mr. Warburton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, the Office of Fire Marshal is, um, as, and I do speak to be clear about the office, not not the not the people at the office, right? So it is, it is structured in a way where currently there's no appeal process. You either comply with the order or whatever they're asking, or you go to court. Um, well, the appeal process is to go to the minister, but the minister is never going to override a subject matter expert. That's never happening. So, um, and right now, if they want to take a week or a year to review, to review your plan, they can bill you the entire time. So it's an unknown black hole. You can't appeal. You have no idea what it's going to cost. Um, and the orders, to be frank, occasionally seem arbitrary and uh, um, oh, just whatever is kind of felt to be the safer option. And if you disagree, that's kind of too bad. So, um, and what and what this does, like the impact on this is massive, right? So um, like there's currently a, a chamber member that's renovating a building and the design and architecture drawings and the stamps that the, that the fire marshal wanted for a wall that existed cost $10,000 and the actual wall fix cost $500, right? There's just this detachment from financial reality for kind of what these delays and costs are, are doing. And there's a number of projects, like I personally have no interest in building something because of that office. And that's not because, uh, it's because I can't quantify the risk. It's a black hole where I, I can't budget for that. I have no idea, it's gonna be $10,000 or $100,000 or $200,000. It's, um, it's not um, a lack of regulation that I think we're asking for. It's just a very standardized, transparent, appealable process. So I just wanna know what that is, right? Um, there's not a lack of interest in building here. There's a, there's there's a, a ton of capital that wants to come into the territory, even from outside, and build things. But this is this is I would say one of the biggest barriers to any of that happening is the fact that you can't put a number on that that particular part of the permitting process. And money hates uncertainty, right? So it, it's not going to I'm, I'm not going to put all that money up front if I'm just going to potentially lose it all. And it just sits there. Um, so yeah, that would be kind of, and like I said, the feedback we've got, like we've heard is that there is a way of doing it through a building standards act, I think. Um, but NACA says six years, nothing takes six years, right? That just tells me it's not important and, uh, and business is hemorrhaging money and millions of dollars not coming to your city is okay to sit around for six years. So um, this is fixable. Um, it just needs to be kind of front of mind. Um, and I, I give the same feedback to the city when it comes to like zoning bylaws and building, uh, building bylaws some of this stuff are not very special. Like we can just take 95% of this from another large city or jurisdiction, tweak it for our own uses. Like it's building standards. This is not, there's not a lot of variability here. We don't need to ask mayors what they think. It doesn't matter. It's a building standard, right? This is very straightforward. So, um, but it just needs to be in place. And currently, because we don't have that, it is just at the whim, whatever the fire marshal think is safest, which is often the most expensive costly option you could possibly do. So. All right, must be for that. Um, next, I have uh, Ms. Knuckleby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I always enjoy hearing from you, Rob, and uh, welcome um, as well. Uh, congratulations, uh, Melissa, on your appointment and Ms. Sire as well. Um, I I guess I had my, my screen off because my uh, also my video and such is, is a bit choppy, my internet, but you would have seen me here as a bobblehead uh, nodding along with pretty much everything that you were seeing. Uh, and I don't know if it's our private sector backgrounds, but I, I definitely hear 
the frustration uh, on some of the, the the slowness of the GNWT to act on things um, and the risk aversion. I've spoken to this in the House before, and I 100% agree that uh, oftentimes we're sitting here waiting for this to become, nobody really wants to be the person who pulls the trigger and says, let's do this until they're at such a level of comfort that they feel that they're not taking any chances. And as a result, that just hampers our, our territory from moving forward. Uh, if anything, COVID was a t- is a time to seize on opportunity for change and and to push for, through that and uh the the gnwt sometimes just gets in the way of itself with its own processes rather than looking at what the sort of the end goal is and and building the process around that so i do really appreciate uh those comments and because of that area i feel fairly uh well versed in and we've spoke before about it rob um, I guess my questions would be more around the Aurora College transformation. Uh, I sit on the other committee, social development, which is more uh, responsible for that um, for that work. And uh, maybe if you'd like, because I understand it, maybe it might be a bit of a controversial subject. Could you explain a little bit more about what you mean or what maybe a better way to phrase it is what do we need to do to ensure that it's not just Aurora College 2.0 uh, and rather is becoming the polytechnic that we want to see that becomes uh, I'm not sure if you watched Mark's uh, presentation but really the polytechnic needs to create that skilled set of labor so that our people are no longer just regulated to being the, the you know the grunt work and and the cleaners etc so maybe you could speak a little bit more to that thank you Mr. Warburton uh, thank you Mr. Chair and thank you Katrina um yeah, uh, to be blunt, uh, I think I was once I could be in that presentation. Aurora College, the original transformational document, was ambitious and actually aimed high. Um, and then, you know, it got politically challenging, is my perception. Um, some people yelled and screamed. And then instead of doing what was good for the whole territory, we did what was politically easy. Um, and we pulled back. And, you know, even look at the areas of study for the Aurora College transformation there's nothing in there that is innovative or forward thinking. It's, it's this idea that we need to provide, like Aurora College needs to provide upgrading and different skills for, it has, it's a very big wide breadth of people, but your students don't care what jobs you, you need to fill. Your students wanna take the courses they wanna take, right? Um, it's, it's like a business selling a product that nobody wants. And you, know, um, you saw us with the social work program before with two people in it, right? Like, doesn't matter how much you want a thing or how much your job market analysis, your skills are success, which is not worth anything, to be honest. The, uh, it, if you're not giving the, the things that, that students wanna take, no one's gonna go. So, um, and the idea that it should be built to focus solely on Northern students is a bit small. Like if you have a world-class institution where you're attracting international students and corresponding instructional talent, uh, you're going to up the bar for everybody, right? So you have you have a higher skill set, you have a higher amount of uh, participants, you can do more stuff. So you can run those courses that aren't economical because you're running the ones that are drawing in people, right? So, um, and so what we've seen so far is like, you know, we got asked to consult on uh, when they had their areas of study, you know, we got two weeks, that was it. We got two weeks notice and they closed off comments and they set they put out their draft and then they got all the feedback saying no one liked it and the draft was stay exactly the same so this is why i feel like it's a preordained kind of bureaucratic process um it will become a polytechnic i think that will happen but um it's not ambitious enough it's not going to change it's not going to move the needle for anyone um if it's not kind of run like most universities run like when u of a does a new program like they have a a master, uh, they have an MBA that focuses, focuses on a social entrepreneurship. And I called the dean and I, uh, the person in the program and I said, well, how'd you come up with that? And they're like, oh, we, you know, we do market surveys for our students every year and this is something that is in demand. They're like a business. They, they provide the courses that the market wants. Whereas what we continue to do here and seem to be doing again is saying, oh, we need heavy equipment operators. So we're gonna run a heavy equipment operator course. Well, if no one wants to take it, then who cares, right? So. It's a, it's a very backwards way of thinking of post-secondary and it's not modern and kind of innovative, right? Um, let's, let's provide the stuff students want uh, and, then, and then we can kind of fill in our gaps there, right? Labor is mobile and we have to accept that. It's not gonna, it's not gonna sit around uh, and wait for you to kind of meet their needs, it'll go somewhere else. So, 
um, yeah, and I, I have I have hope still because I, I know they did a there's a facility study happening, um, which we all know that Yellowknife essentially has no facility. Um, we have no student housing. We have nothing. So, uh, like, I can see how they're kind of bureaucratically going through the steps to try to do it in a way that doesn't offend anybody. But you know, I'm okay offending people if it just gets the whole territory at a better level. I'll see for that. Um, follow up, Ms. Nockleby. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I think anybody that knows me knows that I also find the bureaucratic process uh, and the slowness of it uh, to be something that is really hindering our territory. So I, I completely do agree with that. Um, when you bring, raise the point, though, of sort of bringing the, the college to a, uni or sorry, to a global sort of university level, uh, we did have that discussion as a group, but then the problem becomes that, like you said, it's not, it doesn't become a place for our residents, which then brings us back to our education issues, which uh, then, you know, brings us back to our pre-education issues, and, and you see how it all just becomes a, a, a lot of the social issues are, are prohibiting our, our own students and children from advancing, so um, quite, the, quite the conundrum or I'm not quite sure how we go about uh, fixing all of that, but I, I do uh, sort of appreciate that what you're saying there. Um, I guess then too, I, I'm gonna ask you the same question that I asked uh, Mr. Breyer. Um, if there's one thing that the GNWT could do, and either of you could answer this, that the GNWT could do right now that you think would have like the biggest impact uh, and you don't really understand why it's not <laughs> happening that way. Uh, what would it, what would that be? What would be sort of the area you would suggest as a low hanging fruit, I guess, for us as a committee to push for? Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Warburton. Oh, that's a good question. Give me a second here. <laughs> Look at my, uh, easy and fast. So this involve that in my mind involves no more money, just a change in approach, right? So, um, well, first off, is getting the Border open. Uh, froze again. There. Um, yeah, get. Uh, you hear me? It's good. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I get that border open and get kind of tourism started again. I know it's a small part of GDP, but it is incredibly important. Um, I don't think it's revivable uh, in the short term, but that would be a start. Um, the other thing would be tackling the anything that's a policy or a process. It doesn't require more money. Doesn't require more more uh, allocation in a budget, um, you know, like paying your bill fast. That's that, that was really nice to see during COVID. Let's not go backwards on that. Um, you know, fire marshal office, you know, that, that's in the pipe to do that regulation. Well, how can we get done sooner? You know, well, what's, what's um, like, how, how, do we, how do you change our policies and processes to align uh, with the best bang for buck? Um, and the big one is like, and I don't know how you do this. This is like systemic, but how do you just like, stop incentivizing toxic risk aversion and just get people to just just take a risk just to, i have no idea either so um and i i think it, it has to do with kind of it's not just a culture it is like um the incentives aren't there to do that you know you currently incentives in my understanding is is budget related not performance related so how do you you know you can't say you're not getting performance if you're not incentivizing that thing so um i would say like short term that would be you know, any any policy that that you hear that you th you think as a committee would be an easy win or a process, that's what you should focus on. You know, the big asks of infrastructure and those things are great, but they all take money, federal money. Um, but anything that's in your wheelhouse, one hundred percent to control, let's do that. You know, the fire marshal doesn't need to be that. Like tens of millions of dollars die at the fire marshal every year or more of potential investment development, and that's stuff that can't leave. You build a building, it doesn't go anywhere. So the uh, you know, how do you, how do you fix that? You know, yes, there's legislative process you need to fix there, but I'm sure there's a policy or process or some kind of appeal thing you can put in, in term to six years from now that can get that moving, right? Um, you know, I, I understand government doesn't have any cost to their time, it seems, but you know, we do. So let's, let's, let's make this stuff move a little better, so. Must for that, Mr. Warburton. Uh, I guess that's, all the committee questions there. Um, I had one on, uh, I note that uh, you recommend that the GNWT uh, look at the tourism and business market uh, to get things moving. Um, considering the 
the new uh, virus that's coming around, the Omicron, uh, and heaven knows what else will come up uh, after that even. And the tourism, winter tourism Aurora is, uh, is a big market for Yellowknife, has been for years. Uh, we've seen a real downturn in that industry. Uh, we don't know what's, what's in the future for that. Um, it could be, the possibility could be we've lost the winter maybe perhaps because of the viruses and, and, and new ones coming up as I mentioned before. Um, because, uh, you know, we've noticed in, in the past uh, the caribou outfitters have all gone by the wayside and had to do something else. As the chamber uh, looked at something like this uh, with the crystal ball outlook and, stu uh, and stuff like this and as your office engaged or worked with the office of the chief public health officer, Masi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, uh, for, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the CPHO one first. Um, we have been very, very involved and advocated very hard um, uh, with the CPHO's office and, uh, and also via um, health uh, to make sure that like the economic impact of those things is really understood. Um, you know that the, the chamber has never has never never advocated against uh, good public health uh, like good public health stuff. We, our issue is with the policies to address those, right? So, you know, like currently we have a number of policies uh, around our public health order that are no one else in the country is doing. You know, and uh, when we ask questions to health or CPHR around why, we get no answers. So, it's not there's no it's not a two way street. It's not a there's no. Um, it's like this black box where we can't get answers for things. Um, and we, the chamber's job just wants to make sure that the considerations around the massive impact of these things is being considered. Um, and because like the CPHO is a public health expert, they're not an economist, right? So um, this is why we this is why we, we advocate at that level. Um, you know, to be frank, we haven't seen a lot of um, a lot of pressure put on that office to to be more communicative and, and to share more information. Um, I understand there's this kind of hands off with, with at the political level. You don't want to intrude, but you know, if a public servant is not answering a question, I think that's a reasonable thing to push them to do. Um, and that's kind of all we're advocating for is you know a good conversation on policy and processes and why, like why are we doing something, um, especially when the thing we're doing is not what anyone else in the country is doing. Um, I just want to know why are we special. So, uh, and then around tourism development, we have. Uh, um, you know, we, we, we have kind of let the Tourism Association, uh, you know, in the last past while kind of be the advocate for that. Um, but we've been hearing a lot from tourism operators and uh, uh, that are our members um, that want us to be more vocal. Um, so that's why it's a big part why it's in our presentation too. Uh, and frankly, just watching like, like this, like there's, there's operators selling off jackets. They're selling buildings. Like it's not kind of, it's decimated. It is it is over and and that capacity is just gone like there's there's an operator that had 12 staff they worked from for almost 20 years they're all gone to replace those people is going to take five or ten years to do so you know this is why uh tourism got a particular focus in our presentation is because the government can't seek to support tourism it's it's toast so it it needs some heavy heavy lifting uh to kind of get it going when we open back up um and you know some Emerging wisely was nice to see like hard numbers and metrics, but again, like any business, you just want some certainty, right? Just want to know when, um, you know, our, if we're moving to an endemic approach, then that's great. Let, it'll show me that's, you know, that's happening. So um, yeah, I want the government to really kind of, in the interim, advocate for these businesses to, to kind of help them reopen because it's past support. Like most of them are just, they're, not, they're, they're done, right? So um how, how do we rebuild from the ashes of, of this closure? Um, yeah, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that's fine. And thank you very much for, for that answer and your, your insight into it. Uh, uh, it's, it's very good. Um, I guess committee, uh, we're, we're, we've 
completed uh, this portion of our public presentation. I would like to thank uh, Burton and the uh, Miss Sire for joining us today. Um, any last comments for Warburton? Uh, no, thank, thank you for letting us present and, uh, and please feel free anyone to reach out if you got any more kind of weedy detailed questions. Um, you can reach out to myself at the chamber or um, Melissa's happy to um, kind of go back and forth with you if you got any questions. Um, we're, we're really hooked into the business community. Um, COVID, one good thing about COVID is we've had a lot of engagement from the business community. Um, so we're a great resource for you guys to lean on if you have any kind of business questions or impact, you know, how policy can be changed or tweaked. Um, happy to do that. All right, thank you very much again for uh, presenting to us. Um, Mr. Clerk, uh, we'll wait your inst further instructions. see. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Committee will need a motion to go in camera and a few moments to end the live stream. Thank you. <laughs>